data-driven digital uh, single market in Africa. So I kindly propose that we wait five minutes to have more participants, and we shall start within five minutes. Thank you. And also to enable online speakers to be connected, since we have on-site panelists, and also we have uh, three uh, panelists that will join us virtually. So within s we will shall start within five minutes. Thank you. Morning. I think we shall start because we are uh, we have only one hour, and also we are aware that most of our panelists they have other uh, sessions. So I, I, my name is Suhila Amazuz. I am senior policy officer from the African Union Commission. We are organizing this session uh, on digital trade and data governance in, uh, with uh, with support of our partner uh, GIZ. We have today uh, seven panelists, high-level panelists, that will uh, share their uh, perspectives and thoughts on how uh, Africa can work towards uh, enhancing uh, digital trade and also facilitating cross-border digital trade. So I, uh, from the AUC side, we have uh, made some progress these last years. We have developed uh, the digital transformation strategy for 2020-2030 uh, uh, that has as a main objective is to achieve this uh, digital single market in Africa and this in line with Agenda 2063 Development and Integration Agenda. We have also developed last year uh, a data policy framework and also uh, uh, an interoperability framework for digital ID that aim to to, to strengthen our capacities in uh, managing our data and also facilitating 
uh, movement of people and goods across the continent. Uh, at present, we are working in uh, with collaboration with all regional organizations and in close collaboration with UNECA for the development of an harmonization strategy to create an enabling environment for the creation of digital single market in Africa. So, as I mentioned, we have today uh, seven uh, panelists. We have with us, uh, I, I will uh, follow the or alphabetic order. So, we have uh, Dr. Ifi Ogo online. I hope she is uh, connected. She is a regional coordination specialist for the African continental uh, free trade area. We have Mr. Uh, John Paul Adam, who is director for technology, climate change, and natural resources from UNECA. We have Mr. John Omo, who is the Secretary General of the African Telecommunication Union. We have Mr. Kenneth Mohangi, who is lecturer at the University uh, of Uganda. Uh, and we have with us Mr. Uh, Daniel Morenzi, who is pr uh, Principal Information uh, Officer at East Africa Community. From the FDB, we have uh, Mr. Samatar uh, Elmi, who is Chief Specialist on Africa Develop uh, on ICT. Uh, last but not the least, we have Mr. Uh, Talkmor Chidide, who is a digital trade expert from the AFCA Secretariat. So I think we have we aim to have interactive sessions. So we will give our panelists the opportunity to respond to one question within five minutes maximum. And we'll have the opportunity to take questions and comments from the floor. So it, we aim to open the discussion about what needs to be done uh, in Africa in order to really to, to come up with agreements, with consensus, with a common approach on how to regulate and to, to manage cross-border data flow to enable the uh, intra-Africa digital trade. So the first question will be addressed to Mr. John Paul Adam, who is director within UNCA, our host today. So, uh, Mr. Adam, the FCFTA is a high, has a high ambition trade agreement for Africa with comprehensive scope that includes uh, critical uh, areas such as digital economy and digital trade. From your perspective, what are maybe the key policy interventions and actions that we need to take at continental level in order to boost and enable intra-Africa digital trade? Mr. Adam, you have five minutes. Thank you uh, so much, Soida, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm First of all, thank you so much for involving the Economic Commission for Africa in this very important discussion. Uh, and I'd like to also recognize and congratulate the African Union for the exemplary partnership and for the leadership uh, being uh, displayed. Uh, in particular, we, we know that the template in terms of policies for implementation of the African continental free trade area is the African Union Digital Transformation strate Strategy adopted in uh, 2020. Uh, because digital transformation is the tool that will allow the acceleration of uh, the uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Business as usual is not an option. Now, we, what we think, what we need to do in the context particular of the AFCFTA is to be able to translate the promise of the AFCFTA in, into concrete actions. Uh, and I think we are still at the stage where there is perhaps a gap between the promise, the, percep the, the potential, and the, uh, and the actual implementation. But I, th I would like to start by saying we should never waste a good crisis. And unfortunately, we have too many crises right now. We have, we have the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which many African countries are still recovering from. We have the food and energy crisis, which is associated with the w war in Ukraine. And we have the continuation of the climate crisis, which is costing African countries 5% of GDP. So the, all of these issues mean that we have to change the, 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 the model of uh, the economic model. And I think digital technologies will be key to that. The COVID-19 pandemic has actually shown that uh, in Africa, despite some of the uh, challenges, there has been a positive response. Uh, in a survey that ECA conducted in 2021, uh, we saw that 65% of companies that responded to the survey had said that they had accelerated their digital transition 
uh, in response to the implications of the crisis. In 2021, there was also a record year for investment in Africa tech startups, uh, 2.15 billion US dollars. Some cynics may say this is despite the roles of governments and institutions, but it shows that the direction of, of travel and in terms of the focus of where we need to address uh, efforts, certainly uh, the policy uh, challenges within the AFCFTA uh, need to be addressed. And there are a number of, uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, regulatory challenges that we must, uh, we must address. Uh, first of all, we need to address the issue of infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, we need to also address the issue of uh, electronic transactions and payment systems. We need to um, also uh, address all potential barriers that exist for dig digitally enabled uh, services. Again, the survey that ECA uh, undertook showed that there are, there are um, relatively um, there are not so many restrictions that we might think in Africa, but, uh, but, and I stress this is overall, but we are hampered by the lack of connectivity and we are hampered by the lack of certainty. Sometimes even countries that may have relatively good internet connectivity fall into the trap of internet shutdowns and these cost our economies enormously. And we need to, um, and we are hopeful that through the AFCFTA, uh, we can adopt uh, strategies uh, that can really incentivize the continued investment in harmonization of the regulatory environment across the, the continent. Um, we expect that if we properly achieve uh, the implementation of a digital protocol under the AFCFTA, this will further strengthen the ability for us to achieve trade integration uh, full integration within the continent, and it will also particularly empower uh, the opportunity for medium, small, and med uh, small and uh, micro, small and medium enterprises uh, to be able to ac have access to a wider set of uh, of partners uh, for for trade. Uh, we um, uh, a couple of other just to conclude. I think a couple of initiatives that ECA. Um, are leading and working with partners to deliver, which can reinforce the implementation of a digital protocol under the AFCFTA. Um, firstly, one of the pillars for digital transformation is cybersecurity. It is one which has been under um, under uh, estimated in the past. Notably, only 14 countries have ratified the Malabo Protocol uh, for the moment. But we hope that very soon. We hope this year we will have number 15, which will bring the protocol into force. But more critically, uh, the countries need to be able to, to have uh, a very clear um, implementation of cybersecurity uh, aspects because trade depends on the security of your, uh, of your internet system. And uh, we can't deliver that if we are constantly at risk of hacks or if uh, user data is compromised uh, or if people do not trust to put their personal data or their financial information into the, these uh, systems. Uh, one of the building blocks for this is a model law, which we will be discussing this afternoon. Soren, maybe you can confirm. Is it this afternoon or tomorrow? This afternoon at 3 p.m. We'll be presenting the model law on cyber security. Uh, so that's one aspect. The second uh, area is around the facilitation of uh, digital trade. Uh, through uh, digital platforms. Uh, the ECA helped develop the Africa Trade Exchange, which is currently operated by Afrexim Bank. And this allows a platform to facilitate access of, of African companies uh, to trade their goods uh, on, 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 in the digital space, and including where necessary to have access to trade finance. Because one of the issues may be, and we have seen this in countries like Ethiopia, looking to export coffee. They've discovered huge demand uh, on internet platforms. But often they, have, they don't have the immediate resources to invest in the additional production that is needed. And so the link between digital platforms and then financing mechanisms uh, is, uh, is key. 
And the uh, other area, the third area that I will, I will touch on is artificial intelligence. Uh, and this involves ensuring that there is appropriately, appropriate regulatory frameworks in different countries and that there is capacity for research and the application of artificial intelligence in, for example, uh, the context of trade. And we have the African Regional Center on Artificial Intelligence, which was launched in the Republic of Congo uh, earlier this year and which has created a network of universities and academia around research and artificial intelligence with trade as one of the uh, priority areas. Uh, I will stop there for now, um, but I think that the, the uh, harmonization of work that is being done among different African countries to really deliver on a, a, a digital trade protocol within the AFCFTA is one of the priority actions towards actually changing the economic model on the African continent. Thank you so much. Mr. Ada for highlighting the conditions that we need to to meet in order to enable digital trade in Africa. We agree that the, we need to uh, to narrow or to close the digital connectivity gap and also to to, uh, to put in place the digital platforms that will facilitate the payment and also the cross uh, border uh, electronic transactions. Now we move to our second speaker, Mr. John Omo, Secretary General of the African Telecommunication Union. So from your perspective, how uh, political leadership can foster digital transformation in Africa and also how can we enable uh, data to flow within countries, across countries, and also how we can uh, take advantage of the data revolution to build our digital economy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Soela. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the African Union and the ECA for putting this together. I also want to thank fellow panel panelists. Certainly, JP has, has taken quite a bit of wind off our sail in terms of some of the challenges that uh, uh, characterize uh, data for development in Africa. But I, I, I see the role of political leadership in the pursuit of uh, uh, digital data governance in, in, in three phases or three levels. One uh, is at the level of, of governments, uh, the level of governments, uh, the level of our regional, in, rather sub-regional economic blocks, and certainly at the level of, uh, of uh, the continental, continental level. And uh, whatever the level, there, there, there needs to be uh, quite a clear message to uh, the politicians and, and indeed uh, each and every one of us because we are politicians and political leaders in our own rights, in our companies, in our organizations, in our families. We are leaders, we are politicians. And so it's, it starts with us at the family level, at the organizations where we work uh, before we expand it to our communities, uh, at the national level, at the sub-regional level, and, and certainly at the continental level. I, I think the uh, certain data, the certain characteristics of data that uh, requires political involvement is uh, captured in the four Vs of data the four Vs of data, which is volume, uh, velocity, variety, and veracity. Big data volumes, big data sets that are mind-boggling and certainly require that political players get into this uh, space and, 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 and show leaders, leadership. Velocity uh, in terms of uh, the periodicity of change. Uh, certainly there, there are so many changes in, in the data that we are dealing with. Uh, there's so much variety, whether it, in the form of what I'm saying, which is data in the form of text messages you are sending or those that are writing on their notebooks, uh, certainly sending emails or pictures about uh, this event and so forth. And, and certainly the veracity, we need to ensure that the information that is out there is one that is verifiable and, 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 and so uh, all this uh, then requires a certain level of leadership to ensure that there is an organized way of management of our data. And, and certainly that requires technical skills. And, and what I see is that uh, perhaps uh, we are addressing the political leadership here. 
but uh, much of the information is resident with us, those in this room and those that are listening. Uh, I'm sure some of our politi political leaders are listening, but we seem to be preaching so much to the converted. I don't know whether you get that sense, uh, as opposed to taking the message to our politicians, the political leaders. Uh, because I see quite a, an asymmetry between the knowledge that is available uh, amongst the technical people uh, in terms of the value of data and the knowledge that is resident with the political class and leadership in terms of appreciating the value of data and ensuring then that we have robust systems uh, for data management. And I think we need then to not just upskill, uh, and which I see uh, as necessary in most of our African jurisdictions in terms of technical skills, but also, you know, imbue our data, uh, our political leaders with the necessary <coughs> knowledge that data is indeed important and big data sets uh, are important for the management of national, communal, and, and regional and interregional uh, economic systems and indeed our lives. Uh, I think, as, uh, as I mentioned, JP has, has indicated, has mentioned certain characteristics of data uh, in Africa, but I, I, I see. 12 uh, from 19, 2020, 20, 12 to, to uh, late last year, uh, an increase from 12 to 28 African countries having one form of data legislation or the other. Uh, uh, of those that I uh, analyzed, those data legislations tend to me to emphasize more on fostering safeguards in G data protection and privacy and less focus on data enablers, which is on you know, portability, localization, for example. And uh, implementation uh, then remains a challenge in quite a lot of our jurisdictions, especially at the national level. Uh, most of our data legislation is nascent uh, with the institution of frameworks that are fairly uh, uh, you know, uh, young. And so there are certain jurisdictional, I mean, institutional challenges in terms of capacity, in terms of resource allocation uh, on two organizations that are, that are in charge of, of data management in our respective countries. The other characteristics that I, uh, that I see is, is, of course, at the continental level, as Swahila has mentioned, a lot of initiatives, uh, you know, at the level of the African Union at the level of, of ECA, which, which is indeed great. Uh, but I think we need to translate this at uh, the national and sub-regional level. Quite a lot of efforts are already being undertaken at the sub-regional level, at the political leadership, which is a great thing. Uh, and so what, what I see is, is, is the political leadership at the national level, you know, bringing down what is already agreed at the continental uh, level in terms of national legislation. And it's, it's, it's great that uh, we are just one shot, one county shy of uh, bringing the Malabo Convention into, into force. But I think we, we have lost quite a bit of time uh, since that convention was negotiated. And with data management, time is, is not on our side and our politicians need to acknowledge that the more we delay in uh, you know, actualizing uh, pieces of legislation, our policies, the more those pieces of legislation and policies become irrelevant. Because as I've mentioned, uh, the one common thing about data is its velocity. It's constantly changing. And so whatever framework, legislation, or uh, uh, policies that we have need to be constantly reviewed. And the more we keep them in abeyance in terms of implementing them, the more I see ourselves lagging, lagging behind. Indeed, in all our data indices, uh, Africa lags behind all the other regions uh, in terms of uh, robust data management uh, frameworks. Now, what our politicians can then do uh, is, is certainly anchored in some of these characteristics of data management uh, in the African continent. Create policies and regulations at the national level to promote digital transformation. We've seen quite a bit of that. I've said that uh, from 2012 to uh, late last year, uh, uh, upwards of 28 countries have one form 
or develop one form of data legislation or the other, which is a great thing. But we need to see more of that in the countries that are, have not uh, adopted uh, certain of these policies or legislation. Respond and keep pace with advances in technology. And that is where I see quite a symmetry, as I've mentioned. I think the political class, unfortunately, uh, and the, this, 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 this needs to be said, the political class in Africa, especially at the national level, have not uh, quite uh, appreciated the value of, of data. And we need to drive this message to the political class so that we, they know that without data, without accurate data, you can't do much even as a, at the national level. So I think that message needs to be driven so that there is symmetry uh, that exists between the technical people in terms of knowledge uh, in, on the value of data and that of politicians is, is narrowed. Uh, one, of course, is the power of politicians to use grassroots networks uh, to entrain skills transfer, which, is, uh, as I've mentioned, is, is another area that, that is, 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 is common in Africa in terms of uh, uh, skills development. And I think most of our politicians, especially at the national level, have grassroots networks, and we need to bring everyone on board uh, in terms of the value of data, whether personal data or organizational data. I think in the ex uh, entire ecosystem, I'm finishing, in the entire ecosystem, there are various players that we need uh, to recognize. Uh, they may be government, the private sector certainly plays an increasingly important role in data management in Africa. The partners from various countries uh, uh, and, and regions, and, and we just need to recognize that there's not a single organization or individual uh, whether politicians or government or the civil society or the private sector that has a monopoly of knowledge over this or jurisdiction so that we bring everyone in the ecosystem together for purposes of, 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 of data management. And that clearly is, is the role of, of politicians and certainly institutionalizing structures that we've agreed on for purposes of data management. The other thing that I think we, we need to tell the politicians is that I see, uh, and this needs to be said, I see a lot of uh, institutional overlaps and jurisdictions, jurisdictional uh, conflicts in terms of the partnership engagements in Africa. And so uh, I, I think uh, the UN needs to listen to this, and JP, uh, I hope this message gets across, that our politi political class needs to realize that the partners that engage in various forms of data management in Africa are, are great, but each and every partner comes with an agenda. And so we need to bring all this agenda into a single uh, scheme where it is the interest of Africa at heart, and not so much of the interest of the partners that uh, seek to support data development in Africa. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, there's so much to be said about this. I don't think there's one single answer, uh, but that's the reason we are here, to take questions, comments, and, and to engage in this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you for... Uh for highlighting the importance of upskillings at different levels, from the technical levels to decision makers, and also the need to create a platform for multi-stakeholder discussions and conversation. And also, as organizations, uh, we need to strengthen our cooperation to highlight our priorities, to ensure complementarity between the different initiatives. And I, I fully agree with you that we need to create a link between the technical community, the decision makers, and also the, the diplomats or the foreign uh, affairs, because they are the one who voice the, uh, the interest of the countries at international level, taking into account the ongoing discussions with the World Trade Organization and also the discussions about uh, global digital cooperation, uh, the, uh, data governance. I think we need to build our individual and collective capacity and uh, rising awareness is key in this process. Now we move to concrete example we have with us from East Africa community. Mr. Uh, uh, Daniel Morenzi, he will share with us the progress and also what the key aspects that are being addressed by uh, this community for developing their common digital market. Uh, Mr. Morenzi, can you please make it in five minutes? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, 
for the interest of the time, I had to put up the PowerPoint four slides to explain what the ESC does. And uh, we first of all want to thank the, the opportunity we have given to the East African community to showcase what we are did uh, on the move we are. So on our case as the East African community, allow me to share with you our vision and the agenda for our single digital market that is driving the forces of our single integration on our single digital market. For those that you are in Connect Africa Summit, some 2018, I think, this was the study that we did and we had to take care that how should East African community be number one in moving for the single digital market. And uh, we have taken four pillars for uh, our single digital market and this is anchored on the whole work that uh, uh, Jean Paul talked about, or Omo talked about and what the African Union have done. On our side we have considered the four cases on the side of the data, uh, online data connection and the data connectivity, then the connectivity by itself, then enabling environments. And I will just take you through where we are as the ESC and the key indicators that are driving this. So when you look at this pyramid that we have done, it shows what do we need to do or what are we doing in, in, to ensure that we are moving faster to now uh, achieve our single digital market as we have done. As you are aware, East African community, we have uh, four protocol, I mean for the integration agendas, common market protocol, customs union, uh, political federation and monetary union. So under the common market protocol, that's where even you find this single digital market because there's free movement of people, free movement of goods, free movement of services. So on the uh, single online uh, market as the pillar that would now drive our integration and quickly achieve our agenda that we need as the ESC, we found that there are some promo uh, key pillars that we need to tackle. There is the digital ID. You cannot has already been handling our uh, bulk payments with the central banks. So the next move, we are now looking at the integrating the retail payment, which is now the study that is undergoing, supported by GIZ. We thank you for that. And uh, the uh, consultant service, I mean the report is being handled. So the purpose is now to ensure that all components of the work for cross-border are removed. So on the other side, there is the consumer protection. So we found out that you cannot do the single digital market online without the consumer protection. On the side of the ESC, we have the competition authority that has already been established as an institution and it's already working with the national competition authorities in a manner that makes us now to have the things regulated. The logistics part, because we want now to look at the trade across and how move, movement of goods are going on, then now the harmonization is ongoing and we are now working on that. So on the single data market now, the key enablers as uh, JP has talked about, there's the data protection and data privacy. Uh, this one we have taken the uh, continental framework and now we are anchoring it and domesticating it to the regional level. When we reviewed the region, national data privacy and protection laws, we are really working in isolation. They don't support the data movement across the border. So that's why the region has now come up with this and we are fully supported by World Bank. 
the regional data privacy and protection framework is being finalized under the we are anchoring on to the the continental framework so on the other side of the cyber security which has mentioned as a major challenge the regional level now we have taken uh, a step of ensuring that we now establish a regional SAT or a regional uh, uh, cyber security framework. So this one is being now coordinated at, at the regional level to ensure that we are able to work together. You know now if people are moving, goods are moving, money is moving, as you are aware we are setting up the regional uh, central bank soon. The countries have submitted the expression of interest. So we require to now have a regional collaboration on the cyber security and now the regional framework is on on, on way going so we are looking at also the infrastructure and uh, we are working together on the retail pay, uh, on the retail side and the wholesale side to ensure that our connectivity is affordable so this we have already worked with the africa development bank and the other stakeholders to ensure that we support the national level and they also establish more ex internet exchange points so that the work goes well on the enabling environments the digital skills has been identified as a major gap through the work with the GIZ again. We have established a project for digital skills, and this one has already been now tackling with the private sector. Uh, we, you know, we do have now the 50 million women, we have the women in the platforms. This association is now supporting to be enabled onto the digital skills and other environments that innovation with the innovation hubs within our national. So at the regional level, uh, last week, but one we did the first innovation week that was done in Uganda as a regional platform that brings all the innovations within our context. So this is in one way that for us to achieve the single digital market, all those enabling environments have to move. So on the payment side that has always been talked about and what is our approach at the regional level, uh, our approach is just that the screen is, the translation is hiding uh, the, some of the key things. We have now done in a manner that our architecture, we now know at the national level that there is now the national switch, there is the integration that is happening. But when you move within our region from one country to another, you find there is still a major gap whereby transacting with KCB, ATM to equity to another one, there is another big fee that is going on. So at the regional level, we have seen that when we harmonize and establish now the like regional switch, because now we have the national switches to communicate, we are able to now bring the MNOs, that the interface of the MNOs with our national switches and the regional switch to move. Uh, for your information, we are carrying out the study for data roaming, and the regional data roaming is on the way. Uh, we are looking on the way that we can now enable the regional data roaming and the cross-border mobile money. So these are all the components that we find that can enable the digital trade we are talking about. We did not forget about the money rounding. You know, it's another big challenge that uh, if you look on the architecture that we have done, we have the counter... The, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, on this, there is the anti-fraud body of the national banks, central banks, the, way, the credit bureaus. So this is the whole ecosystem that the architecture of the East African community we have come up with. And at the uh, implementation level, central banks have already uh, collaborating because we have already now established a central bank platform and they are now collaborating to bring to help us to bring the retail payments of the commercial banks so this is the way the region we are moving and we believe that uh, once we have completed this we can share the experience with uh, our colleagues lastly uh, we are looking at the, uh, this is our proposed unified payment interface uh, we know very well the digital gaps that uh, John Paul has mentioned, Omar has mentioned there, and others keep on talking. Uh, we know that our colleagues, not all of them are on the smartphones. They are those who are still on the future phones, USSD and the rest. So the platform of our unified payment, which we are now building up and we are now working with uh, our central banks and the commercial banks, and also the third party players is to come up with a unified pay, uh, interface which we found that the successful uh, implementation happened in India and I think in Brazil and we are anchoring on this. So briefly, uh, colleagues, this is the journey the East African community have taken 
And uh, I wanted to say that we have already uh, secured funds to now remove the, uh, the, uh, the policy challenges that we had. Today we are now working on the digital signature that has already been a major challenge on two implementations to be now harmonized at the regional level. And also the, uh, the regional data protection and privacy law that was an, another bottleneck. But I just wanted to let you know that this is where we are as the East African community. And we have taken into consideration that the region has to communicate with the, the rest of Africa and beyond. And we also know very well that we have the APA and other conventions that we are trading beyond Africa. So within our ecosystem, we are taking it in that direction. And uh, we, we are happy to share more. Uh, due to the time constraint, allow me to stop from here. I would welcome more questions and engagements during the tea break. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Daniel, for this uh, update. We are really happy to see the progress that is uh, being made in East Africa. And uh, as you mentioned, it will be really interesting to share with other regions and also to see how we can build on the work of East Africa to come up with a continental approach for the digital single market. Now we have another speaker online. I don't know if Mr. Uh, Samatar is connected to update us on another initiative that is a concrete uh, initiative which uh, will start next year. It is about build uh, development of digital single market. Uh, Mr. Samatal, maybe a few words, maybe in five minutes or less, if you can just update us on this uh, initiative between the African Union Commission with support of the African Development Bank and how this initiative will contribute to the development of digital market in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. We hear you very well, and uh, we see you also. It's okay. You can proceed. Panelists, and as well as to the other participants. Uh, I would like to say a few words on the project, uh, upstream project for digital market development in Africa uh, that has been approved uh, last September uh, by the board of directors of the bank. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that it's important actually to note that the setting up of a digital single market in Africa is a long-term process on which we must all work uh, for its achievement by 2030 uh, based on the SDGs. Uh, second, I think it's essential to note that it's not enough to work at country level only to provide solutions. And we do that through the numerous uh, national, regional and multinational projects funded by the bank but it's also important actually to address the issues hampering the generalization of digital services access in, in the continent uh, in order to concretize uh, the digital single market. Uh, admittedly, uh, these actions remain fundamental to prepare the ground for the setting up of an African uh, digital single market step by step. Uh, I think, however, it's crucial also to address uh, the supranational issues in collaboration with the various economic communities as well as the African Union Commission uh, in order to ensure uh, the overall consistency of the action that has to be uh, undertaken. Uh, in addition, I think it's also important to draw lessons from the past by avoiding absolutely uh, to have the market as the only horizon here and forgetting uh, the central role and needs of African population in the digital transformation agenda of our continent. Uh, therefore, it's important to equalize jobs, uh, innovations, entrepreneurship opportunities from north to south and from east to west on the continent. And this is also requires, among others, the implementation of all laws, regulation, policies, and strategies that are necessary uh, to guarantee the protection of uh, personal data and uh, the promotion of cybersecurity and the reliability of electronic transactions. Having said that, uh, the African, as I said uh, uh, pre previously, the African Development Bank's Board of Directors 
have approved has approved actually uh, a grant of seven million uh, units of accounts, which is equivalent uh, to nine point seven seven million US uh, last September for the first phase of the upstream project for digital market development in Africa. Uh, the grant has been uh, the grant agreement has been signed actually two weeks uh, ago uh, between AUC and FDB, and the project kickoff. Uh, is planned on January 2023 uh, in Addis. Actually, this project uh, supports the AUC implementation digital economy project to enhance continental single digital market. And this is uh, the subject of this session today. Uh, it's also It will also support the implementation of the African continental free trade area and the digital transformation strategy uh, for Africa. Uh, actually, the details are, are available uh, online uh, on this project, but uh, what I would say here, it uh, it will contribute actually to the implementation of digital enablers, uh, namely universal access uh, to uh, broadband infrastructure, uh, sovereign African cloud, African digital market, e-commerce, digital trade promotion. So all these actions and activities uh, will be actually uh, uh, funded through through this project, uh, and more broadly, it will help to create a conducive ecosystem for for digital trust uh, skills, and we will also help uh, in the setting up of an African expert networks on digital development uh, uh, in in general. So uh, that's uh, what I would like to say on uh, this project that is going to be. They launched in uh, January in Addis. Uh, so we would be uh, pleased if you also can attend that uh, meeting that will 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 uh, will be uh, happening in uh, in January uh, next next year. Thank you very much. Us this uh, information about this relevant project that will help to develop continental digital economy and also to, as you mentioned create the right conducive uh, ecosystem and enabling environment that will foster the development of data-driven uh, economy and uh, applications. So we, as you mentioned, this, pro this project is in line with AFCFTA priorities and also the digital transformation strategy. We have with us a speaker from the uh, AFCFTA Secretariat, Mr. Shididi. He will update us on the protocols on the protocols of the on the digital trade and e-commerce uh, we will see, we have this where it was highlighted by previous speakers that uh, the second phase of negotiations of safety is on digital trade and e-commerce so mr shididi what is the status and uh, how this will f will uh, contribute to the establishment of digital market in africa uh, thank you very much uh, good morning to everyone uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting the FCFTA Secretariat to be part of this discussion um, today. You might have not seen me on the poster, but um, I'm here now. Um, <laughs> let me just give you a brief background on the FCFTA. It has been mentioned by the previous speakers. Um, so. The African Continental Free Trade Area is a very ambitious project which is trying to establish a single market, single continental market between and among all the 55 member states of the African Union. And the agreement establishing this um, ambitious project is quite comprehensive. It covers a whole range of issues, uh, trade-related issues. Initially, it covered trade in goods, trade in services, investment, intellectual property rights, and competition policy. And then at a later stage, uh, e-commerce, which is now digital trade, was also added. And more recently, women and youth in trade. So these will be protocols. But for the sake of time, I will focus on the negotiation, the update on the protocol on digital trade. So in February 2020, the African Union Assembly, heads of state and government, decided that let's include a protocol on e-commerce within the framework of the African continental free trade area. And 
um, in May 2021, the Council of Ministers responsible for trade decided, okay, let's change this e-commerce to digital trade, which is more appropriate to what we are trying to achieve in the African continental free trade area. So this is how now it moved. So there are not protocols, there are not two protocols, one on digital trade, one on e-commerce. It's one protocol, which is digital trade. Um, I think I, I have to get that clear so that there is no uh, confusion. So the formal negotiations haven't really started, but it doesn't mean that there was no work that was done um, from that time um, when the assembly decided that we have to negotiate the protocol on digital trade. A lot of work has been done, especially by the FCFTA Secretariat, which is the technical body of this FCFTA um, project. Uh, so the committee um, on digital trade was established. So this is the committee that negotiates the protocol. And then they will submit it to senior trade officials, council of ministers, until it is adopted by the assembly. So this committee comprises of all the state parties, the trade officials from state parties. Um, so it was established in May 2021. And they haven't met for their first meeting. They are meeting next week from the 5th to the 9th of December to kickstart the official negotiations of the protocol on digital trade. I'll give you, um, um, I'll, I'll go into details on what are the objectives of this meeting. Um, as I said that, so we have done quite a lot of work, uh, exploratory work and preparatory work in preparation of the formal negotiations as the AFCFTA Secretariat. So I will briefly mention some of the work that we have done and the negotiations are member state driven. So it's the government officials, the member states that negotiates, but we have also tried to ensure that the process is as inclusive as possible to include non-state actors in the process. So this is the part of the work that we have done. So we have done brainstorming sessions, the technical brainstorming sessions. We had digital trade experts, ICT experts from across the continent, such that we just brainstorm with them to hear and bounce ideas on what exactly do we need to include in this protocol. And then following, after following the technical brainstorming session, we had a high level session where we had the industry uh, heads and experts, um, digital related experts across the continent to also brainstorm at a high level to see what are the expectations and what are the key issues that we should address in this protocol on digital trade. Um, then after that we had a regional, we had regional stakeholder consultation. So now we are now dealing with businesses, civil society organizations and other relevant stakeholders such that we hear their views and their proposals and expectations of the protocol on digital trade. What is it that they expect? What are the, the issues that they want the protocol on digital trade to address? And we have come up with a report which will be submitted for consideration to the negotiators, the, the, um, the committee on, on digital trade. And we have also done a study on the state of, so we have developed a situational analysis which is going to be validated next week, a situation analysis of digital trade across the continent. So we are taking stock of um, what is the state of digital trade across the continent and where do we stand in terms of the policy, legal and regulatory framework of digital trade since the protocol is going to develop a continent-wide legal and regulatory framework for digital trade that is going to govern intra-Africa digital trade. Um, so lastly, the, I mentioned that the committee which is responsible for negotiating this protocol is meeting for the first time next week from the 5th to the 9th of um, December. And the objective of this meeting is first of all to kickstart the negotiations of the protocol on digital trade. So they have to adopt their terms of reference. They know, have to know what are the rules of engagement, what are the terms that are governing their um, activities as they engage and undertake this work of digital trade. And they also need to adopt their guidelines and principles. So the guiding principles that will guide them as they negotiate this protocol on, on digital trade. Um, thirdly, they also need to define the scope from the onset. 
before we start even developing a protocol on digital trade or the zero draft, if I may say, we need to know the scope of this protocol. So this is something that they also need to define um, for next week, such that they decide from the beginning uh, the, the scope and the elements that should be included in this protocol should look like this. Then moving from that, we we'll develop the protocol on digital um, trade. So, and lastly, to validate the situation, we have done the situation analysis, but it needs to be validated by the committee so that they can confirm if our results are real or our results, they really speak to the situation across the continent. Let me stop here. I'll be happy to take any questions um, also get some comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. GDD. It's very important to know that uh, there is uh, already a committee that is set and also the negotiations will start uh, next week. I think we, we are... Uh, we are all progressing at the same uh, pace, and I think uh, we need to create synergies between the different initiatives and the study that is being done on the analysis of digital trade across Africa will help to, uh, to shape the discussions. I think we have with us another speaker from uh, UNDP, Mrs. Ifi Ogo, regional coordinator. She supported countries in the phase, uh, first phase of, uh, coordination, uh, of negotiation of the CFTA. Now that we are moving to the second phase, as it was mentioned by the colleague, it's about protocols on digital trade. How can we prepare our countries in order to come up with the forward-looking digital trade agreement that considers cross-border data regulations, innovation, privacy, and also uh, security issues? Uh, Mrs. Efi, you have the floor, I, and we would appreciate if you can make it within five minutes or less. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning. Um, thanks to all the speakers, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I think your question touches upon several interconnected topics, uh, and as we can see, there's already a lot of movement on these issues. For example, with, did, with the data, the mandate from the heads of state on the e-commerce protocol explicitly mentions the member states preparing to have authority over data. You've also spoken about the AU data policy framework, which was published a few months ago. Um, you see that also the member states already have rules on these issues. For example, on data privacy, you have about 33 of the member states that have some kind of law on this. And a lot of these laws speak to the protection of personal information. You also find that on cyber security, there's a, at least 39 countries that have some sort of rules on this. And so this is all of to say that there's indeed a starting point. And then uh, on the AFCFT protocol, it's important to bear in mind that countries will typically negotiate from a, from their stance or what they what what they, they want to preserve those things they're interested in. So it is then important to say what are the existing and what could be the eventual continental frameworks on these topics. We, we see in some sense that there's some common interests, co common purpose, for example, through the Malabo protocol. But the reality is that there is variable geometry. C -c -c countries have their, the things they're interested in. Countries may, may not all be in the same place in terms of their capacity. They, they have various policy stances, but overall there's interest and in, in saying this is what they, they want to do. So in the AFCFTA e-commerce protocol, the issue is that it, at the end of the day, this, the, the approach will be determined by the state parties. But the high, what I would like to highlight is that the canvas is not blank. There are common interests. So the issue really is how do we try to attempt to reconcile the various and divergent stances on these topics. And so there are three main things that one can th think about. One is to understand the rules that exist, and then to understand the constructs, the constructs and the functions of the institutions that take care of those rules. This will help to understand the incentives, the drivers, the purposes of the member states as they have created these rules, because these are the rules that will inform their stances in the AFCFTA. And then beyond the specificity of the, how those specific rules are, you need to understand also how those rules are, are linked in the, in the broader architecture of the member states. And the, the, the two, you also need to look at the effects of these rules. Have these rules realized the objectives for which they were created? 
And then for those of the member states that don't have rules on these topics, it's also helpful to understand why, you know, why have they not done this? Is this a policy issue? Is it uh, an interest issue? Is it, is, is it in progress? Why have they not created these rules? Also to check the effect of these rules and say, what are the effects of those rules that exist? And what are the effects where there are no rules? It's good to understand the context. And then finally, it would be also to see that when you have a better sense of the rules that exist, have the institutions that take care of these rules, the effects of all these rules, then you can say within the African continent, what are the, the, the groups of issues? What are the types of things that the member states are interested in? What are they trying to address through rules? What types of rules do they, they deploy to what types of issues? And then it might then be a bit more straightforward to say, how can all of these things play in the AFCFTA? And while I know we talk a lot about the AFCFTA, it's important to remember that it's a trade deal. Um, it's And it's one of a few trade trade deals on the continent, and is also one of a few instruments on the continent to realize the Africa we want. So the, the AFCFTA can do a lot of things, but it's also good to understand the extent to which it can take on all of these interesting things that uh, we are trying to achieve. So thank you very much. The time. And also for highlighting that it is a, a trade agreement, so there will be negotiations and the countries, they will uh, seek to find the consensus and to reconcile between the different aspects, how to make va uh, data available, accessible for innovation, how to enable uh, value creation, and also at the same time ensure uh, uh, respect of the security, sovereignty of states, and also the protection of digital rights of African people. We thank you for your intervention. The last one uh, we have from the technical community, we have Mr. Uh, Kenneth Mugang Mohangi, who is lecturer of uh, University, Christian University of uh, Uganda. The question that we would ask is how to integrate uh, data in the negotiations of the uh, intellectual property and uh, competition chapters that we can set the minimum standards and also clarify of the status of data as a strategic resource that uh, uh, to enable us to make data available, namely the non-personal data accessible to enable and facilitate innovation and uh, digital entrepreneurship in Africa. Mr. Kinnett, can you make it in within five minutes? Yes, of course. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. My name is Kenneth Mohanji. I, I'd like to think that I'm the last speaker because you needed a change of scenery. As you can see, I am outside. I'm calling you from Uganda. And in particular, actually, having this call and speaking to you in Ethiopia when I'm in Uganda, outside of a capital, moreover, I'm in a city of, of I mean, a district called Kampala, sorry, called uh, Mbara, which is outside of Kampala. That really, even, even if I was to start with that, really highlights the importance of harmonization, one, not only of our policies, but also in terms of things like connectivity and data, because these are things that drive our economies. And especially all the, all the speakers before me have spoken about the Africa continental free trade area and its focus on trade in a data-driven economy. And really we see that if you have policies within our countries, that are focused on actually pushing digital trade, on using data, leveraging data in a manner that would allow it to be able to achieve its objectives, which first and foremost, of course, uh, if you're looking at the different types of uh, data sets, I think here we're looking at more on the non-personal data, which is data that is used in analytics. And if you use or if you leverage this data, we've seen that in terms of service delivery, in terms of uh, in, in terms of improving the quality of service across the different sectors and specifically around digital trade. This is something that is important. And so I think one of the key uh, uh, issues I wanted to highlight, which I, which I hope we'll be able to discuss this more, is if we have a data-driven economy, is it driven by governments? Is it driven by the private sector? I think we've seen that whenever we're looking at data overall, the data that we've spoken about is in relation, especially within the private sector, to entities like social media entities. But where we use that data mostly for marketing, and uh, these entities use it to be able to improve their service delivery and also improve their service offering that they have. But we've also seen that this data is ever more important in in the context specifically of, of, uh, of African countries that need to be able to make informed decision when creating policies. 
I think one of the key sticky points has been uh, around uh, the taxation of uh, digital assets. And really, without governments utilizing or leveraging data that's able to inform spending habits or patterns, that's able to see uh, how to tax these platforms, but without really trying to stifle the asset industries that they're actually operating, is something that is important if we are to have success not only with, in a country like Uganda, but also on, a, you know, if, if you're looking at it in terms of our, of, our, of our blocks within the region and of course as a continent as well. So outside of that, really, I think we must also be able to distinguish or see the difference between anonymized data and personal data. And I think uh, one of the previous speakers had already mentioned this, and this I'm happy the Africa Continental Future and Area Protocols actually do mention this, where we're looking at if we're going to regulate data, you cannot have the same regulations for anonymized data, which is data that does not identify uh, human beings. And uh, you, you cannot regulate it the same way as data that, that, that is categorized as personal data, because that one you have all, uh, all these other rights that are attached to it, like the right to privacy and so on. So I think um, first and foremost as well, uh, we do have the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, but we still have a few countries within the African uh, on, on the African continent that are yet to ratify this uh, particular convention. So I think outside of that, we also still need to have buy-in from every African state, especially those that are signatories to the AFCFTA. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to report that Uganda was among the first countries actually in, in Africa to have a data protection law in compliance with that particular convention. And now as we speak, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, these are all East African countries within our regional bloc have also created their own data protection laws. And we can see that now we are moving towards a harmonization or standardization of these laws. And actually, if, if, if I'm now looking at the movement of data, we can also look at the cross-border transfer of data, which is, some, which is a sticky subject in many jurisdictions, because if you have, or if you have uh, 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 different, different systems or structures, that makes it difficult to be able to have data move from one, board, sorry, from one country to another. And I think if we're looking at the, the, at the industries where data is most prevalent and that we need to be able to talk about, you know, the previous speaker spoke about payments. We've also, we've also spoken about digital trade in particular. And we see that data is what facilitates these, these uh, industries. Without data, I don't think it would be possible to conclude any of these transactions. But I think even if we have laws, that is good. We also need to have buy-in from our countries to make sure that there is also harmonization in terms of implementation. Because if Uganda, if you have a payment company in Uganda that's basically trying to operate in Nigeria, trying to operate in Ghana, trying to operate in Ethiopia, if, there, if you don't have data centers that are as equipped uh, to be able to store this data within those particular jurisdictions, then you'll find that we will be transacting cross-border within the African continent, but you find that most of that data will be kept in servers in Europe and elsewhere. And this would be such a shame because all these still are revenues, sorry, are, are avenues for revenue for, for the countries that, uh, that uh, uh, where these data centers are actually localized. But number two, it also uh, moves to the principles of data protection, especially the principles of, of, uh, of our security of data and of localization of data. So we could also borrow really from uh, jurisdictions like the European Union, like the GDPR in terms of its implementation on things like standard contractual clauses that make it possible for countries to be able to transfer data across borders, but in a manner that is contractual, where all the parties are cognizant, one, of the data protection uh, laws as they apply. Number two as well, that there are certain criteria that is set that makes it, that the standards that we're that we actually talking about. And I think in the question that you've asked, it is important to have these minimum standards because that's what then ensures that you have that harmonization and that we're all moving together. But then it's also very important to note that as we borrow from these other jurisdictions, it's important not to just borrow these provisions as they are, we need to look at the context of Africa. You know, things like consent, the GDPR, has uh, more stringent requirements, let's say, for consent, specifically around digital trade. But is that practical for Africa, where we're still, uh, although we have adopted technology, we still have a huge population that's still uh, semi-literate when it comes to the use of these tools. And so I think we need to be cognizant of that as we regulate and as we harmonize as well. Outside of that, I think one of the protocols that I'm most excited about that has come from the Africa continental free trade area is the one on intellectual property. As we know, intellectual property is the driver of digital trade, is the driver of trade. 
because without intellectual property, it'd be impossible for any of these companies to be able to trade freely, knowing that their goods are going to be respected, knowing that their brands are going to be respected within the countries that they are that they are that they are uh, that they are expanding or moving into. And so there's also uh, there's also a need to be able to to harmonize in our intellectual property laws. As we know, intellectual property is territorial, is geographical, in the sense that the laws would apply within the borders of the country where a particular person is operating. So if we were to go outside of those borders, it is necessary for us to also ensure that through conventions, through bodies like the African Union, that like the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, we're able to come up with protocols that allow a harmonization of laws where you know that you have a reciprocity. So, so where you know that you have a... a, a a way to uh, to uh, to make sure that if if I have a law in Uganda that ensures that I'll have my trademark registered properly, that that same law is going to be reciprocated in another African country, and I'll be able to get redress in case someone uh, uh, uses uh, oh, sorry in case someone actually uh, tries to counterfeit my goods or uses my my, my trademark in a manner that is not uh, uh, that, that 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 I have not consented to, and so I think. All those issues are very important as we're looking at harmonization of these laws. And it's very important as well to be able to think practically in relation to the African context. And this is something, again, I'm really happy about that as we speak about Africa, we have Africans actually sharing issues from their particular jurisdictions about how we can all be able to push this, this uh, digital trade thing, about how we can all also be able to be connected at the same level rather than us you know having all these policies in the air but where the implementation is actually uh, is actually difficult i think that's all i have to say about that thank you thank you for emphasizing the need to bring the private sector on board and also to have informed decisions that will enable the, the avail uh, creation of value from data and also we, this we can be achieved through data categorization and also setting of the adequate and necessary mechanism that will govern uh, the cross-border of data across the continent. I think with this we come to the end of the questions that was addre uh, were addressed to our panelists. Now the floor is open for questions and we can take maybe five since we are out uh, running late. I think I will take from this side and we move from this side. So we have, maybe uh, I kindly invite you to introduce yourself and if possible, to whom you address the question. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for the panelists. Uh, it's a, it, it is a really wonderful panel and uh, yesterday we had the, also a panel on the governing the cross-border data flow. So my question is that actually we, we, we have seen many of the FTA already, you know, the CPTPP, ICP. So, Actually, uh, in, uh, in all those uh, FTAs, there's uh, exceptions, you know, like a public interest exceptions, public policy exceptions, and the national security exceptions. So I wonder whether in the other kind of FTAs, uh, they also have these uh, two exceptions, but the, uh, also these two exceptions are quite broad. Do you have any concrete you know, definition about what does comes to us, national security. So the first question, the second question is about the digital trade. We talk about data trade uh, among the different uh, African countries and the cross-border uh, data trade. Are you giving the property right to the data? How do you trade it? I mean, in terms of data, how do you trade it? Uh, do you give the property right to the data so we can trade it? Yeah, my question. Thank you very much. I think we have an issue that we, there is another session that will take place in the same room. So we do apologize. Maybe we take second question from this side, and I would start with a uh, gentleman from. And I promise that we will uh, continue this discussion in other forums, that we will have opportunity to organize other events where we will have uh, the discussion. So we take uh, second question. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm Dr. Mohamed uh, Yassin from the University of Lille in France, where I'm working on a project on uh, global e-business. It's denominated Easy Africa. Uh, I have, I was a former, I am a former first undersecretary of uh, federal governance in Sudan. Uh, my job ended by the Coupe d'Etat in 2021. While I was working on uh, digital transformation of the governance system in the country by a grant from the World Bank of 200 million uh, US dollars as a first stage. Unfortunately, this is, is put on hold. 
I, I have a, for the sake of the time, I, I, I'm sure I will not get an answer for this, uh, uh, for this question because of the time limit and the mismanagement of the time during the session, which is unfortunate. But uh, uh, necro, uh, Necroma uh, on, in the 60s called for a central bank of Africa. And still now we are uh, not able to, to do it. Uh, with this regional uh, economic communities fragmentation, is uh, AFCTA uh, a possibility to reunify this regional economic community and how we can address this challenge? I, I suggest to create a, a virtual group to continue this discussion. The Secretariat can take hold on that and we will work on it because of the sake of the time and we cannot do it now. Uh, I have other questions also related on the scaling up of the East African community uh, experience and since it, it has South Sudan as a new member and South Sudan has not ratified the, the agreement how you are going to take it on board uh, what type of assistance and that and then I have other issue on the asymmetry between the technician and the political leaders uh, the political leader uh, political will how we can induce and stimulate political will to uh, enhance and boost the African continental trade uh, not only in digital, but also in free movement of goods and services, and uh, make reality the uh, Afri continental uh, ID, how we can make uh, an African unique passport for all the African, not only East African community, uh, single passport, so any African can have access and free movement to own any country, and we get rid of this, uh, uh, this disaster of 1885, which imposed borders on us. Now we, ha we are very intelligent to keep these boards, but these boards has no sense. It could be s considered as an administrative thing, but not to be a political continue to, to be, if you want an African to negotiate, negoti negotiate agreement at uh, global level. They have to go as 1.3 billion person, not a single country or any of these fragmented regional economic communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, I think I will give the floor maybe to, to our panelists the, if they wish to respond to two questions or maybe just to conclude in one minute each and I propose to continue the discussion in the coffee break. And as I said, I promise that in collaboration with all the organizations, we'll continue these discussions and we'll have the opportunity to organize dedicated meeting to this. So I would start maybe from the from, from the Mr. Omo, just in one minute. Uh, one minute, just concluding remarks. And uh, I think uh, the necessary, the political will, at the highest levels possible in our governments, in our institutions, in our regions, is necessary in this regard. The asymmetry that comes is that uh, the most of our politicians at the national level still do not appreciate the value of data. At, I mean, l look at where you are at the University of Lille and compare that with the National University of Khartoum. The level of funding for research, you can't compare. And so our politicians need to appreciate the fact that without research into some of these contemporary issues, you can't generate sufficient information for decision making. It starts with us telling the politicians that this is at the core of our development and we will not let it pass. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Adam, one or two words? No, thank you very much. I think that um, building on, on that previous point, um, we should also not uh, underestimate how far we have come. Uh, I, I think even around 2015, if we had talked about achieving the AFCFTA, we would have said it would not have been possible. Uh, we were talking at that time of building blocks and so on. And then in 2019, we have the AFCFTA. There's still a long way to go. But I think that focusing the vision of where we want to go is a very important step. And the fact that the digital protocol, for example, is one of the uh, priority areas, there is a working group, these are uh, indications that there is a commitment to move in this direction. And it is important that all institutions try to support this process by using evidence-based uh, inputs to move it forward, because that is what will drive us quickly forward. I, I can't resist 
to talk about the debate about central banks because this is something which of course is, but I, I, to say very shortly, I think it's important to have that debate and that conversation, but I would say there are a lot of other policies that need to happen first before uh, uh, the idea of uh, an African central bank is going to be a reality. That does not mean not to talk about it, it doesn't mean not to research it, but I think unless we can address, for example, these issues of the AFCFTA, the, uh, the idea of a, a central bank will be uh, not really feasible in any case. And then, of course, there will be the issues of uh, what kind of instruments we want to have on that. We can continue the discussion, but I would say that it is important that we deal with all of the other building blocks to be able to allow us to have that conversation in a more meaningful manner. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, on our side, uh, we we believe in the people-driven, private sector-driven. So at the regional level and also our wish at the continental level is to involve all stakeholders, not only the political part, uh, uh, leadership, but also having the private sector because they are the consumers of these services and also the civil societies. So at the regional level and at the continental level, we are advocating to ensure that as we are looking at the digital, uh, uh, single digital market, all players are not left behind. Lastly, on what you have mentioned, on the East African community level, uh, our treaty is anchored on who, who has signed. So even if you have not ratified the, the CFTA, but they are already the members. For your information, uh, DRC has also signed on the treaty. And also, the next year, we expect to expand to Somalia. But as I conclude, we advocate for the private sector to drive this single digital market because they are the ones who are already knowing the gaps that the government are imposing. And the gaps that we face on the policy level are only shown when the private sector and our civil society and such a forums of IGFs to continuously be given a national, regional, and continental platforms for the better engagement. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so in conclusion, I'd say that the protocol on digital trade um, is poised to provide the legal and regulatory framework that is conducive and appropriate to address Africa's needs. But also need to bear in mind that we are dealing with 55 countries and countries that are at different levels of development and most importantly, different levels of regulatory capacities. So the way to achieve the most, especially within this continental-wide approach at, um, arrangement, is for us to have um, an approach that accommodates these regulatory flexibilities and also the implementation plan that is conditioned on capacity building, technical assistance, and also the mobilization of resources. That needs to underpin the process, not only to come up with a, with a regulatory framework, but also to come up with technical capacity, a technical assistance capacity building, and also mobilization of resources to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you all. I uh, kindly invite you to join me in thanking our panelists, uh, the on-site one and the virtual one. Mine is just to thank you for your participation and also I would like to present my apologies for the organizers of the next session. So with this, we come to the end of this session. Thank you for your participation.